I used to volunteer on uh, BFM and yeah. do a show called the True School Hip Hop Show. And up there, you know, I got to know basically all the people that were coming in and out, lots of volunteers. Mm -hmm. And it was one of the guys, I think he was doing Drive at the time, he called The Professor, Yep. Um, Glenn. And, and he took a liking to me and also my music. He'd heard, you know, stuff that I was playing on the True School and on other shows. And he was like, I'm going to introduce you to some friends of mine. They're releasing music locally. They're independent, small time, but really good dudes and they're on the right track. And I think you might, you might something might happen. Mm -hmm. No big promise, no big deal. Yep. You know, I'd had other offers from other people, um more established labels but they didn't understand me and I didn't understand them I was scared yeah. I was scared to go there yeah I was like I don't get it and so I went and talked to these guys and they were like wicked we like your music you seem like onto a guy but we don't know anything about rap or anything about hip hop and yeah. that's all you're bringing to us so we don't know if we can do a good job for you yeah and I said hey you just give me a chance to go in the studio <laughs> I'll take care of the rest yeah Total bullshit, didn't know what I was doing, <laughs> you know, but it worked too, and, and, yeah. and, and, you know, I lived up to my end of the bargain, so essentially, I walked in there trying to just get an opportunity to record my music, yeah. and walked out of there with the label deal, yeah. like, basically they gave me my own imprint, because they had a, a name for, like, Cog Transmissions was yep. a certain sound of music, and I didn't fit, so I think they partly wanted to keep me over here, and I wanted to keep myself over mm. here and be different, so we made up this brand, we called it Dirty Records. And that was the beginning of my company, Dirty Records, which exists today. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and they let me come back every day. So the more I came back, the more work I got. <laughs> and if they weren't doing something else in the studio, I was in there telling Chris what to do with my beats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, turn that up and, you know, do this and that. And then he, he loved it too because yeah. had, had, it was just enthusiasm, a yeah. lot of energy. So it worked. Yeah. So was that your first sort of when you first stepped into the role of the producer as such? Were you bringing other guys in? And Yeah. Yeah. Yep, totally. And it's always been some at that point. I mean, had you been writing sort of beats with the thought that you'd be getting other people in to either put vocals on it or other musicians to work on it as well? Yeah. Well, post post that that experience with Shay. Yeah. And and doing that stuff because I got to sit with him while he did his entire Navigator album in the old Revolver, Revolver Studios. Yeah. In Royal Oak. So I would just turn up. I'd be like, "What time are you in the studio?" I'd be like, "Yeah, five p.m." So I get there at five. Shay would get there at half past seven, eight. Um, <laughs> you know, um, and I just sit on the couch, like just like this, sit on the couch at the back of the room, and they're up there, and Shay's either in the booth or he's by the Pro Tools with with Neil, the engineer, yep. and they're bringing different musicians in and from our band, the Crates, and other people. And I just sat there and watched, and I would be there till five in the morning because they just did these crazy night shifts mm. every day, and I just learnt. And I was like, that's how you produce a record. I just yep. watched Shay produce his album. Yeah. And how he uh, interacted with the engineer and the communication, how he interacted with the other musicians that were playing on his songs, mm. and how he interacted with his other MCs that might guest on the songs. Yeah. And then also how he did his own vocals. And it was like a masterclass. I just sat there mm. and I was like, whoa, this is cool. And I was so excited to be there. And I got to do my little scratches and add my bits. Um, and for the tracks that I produced... I really just provided a beat, mm. and he went to town and, and made the song. And every yeah. now and then he asked me, is that cool? Does that sound good? Making sure that I was <laughs> involved have, yeah. in the process. And I'd be like, yeah, bro, me. <laughs> Everything you do, look it. But no, to be honest, I'd, still, I'd still be critical. I still had that streak in me. I'd still be like, mm, maybe that line, bro. But it was cool, and I learned, I got my confidence up, yeah. and I learned where I could say, I don't think that line was good. Maybe yeah. we should redo that. And then I took that experience into working with all of my mates who were complete, at the time, complete novices, mm -hmm. as we all we were all new. Yeah. Uh, I'm talking about like all the Decepticons, so Savage and Mareko and Alfred Stevolo, um, these, uh, man, Four Corners, um, Scribe was a huge part of the album. So all my mates, that we were all new and no one had music out, really. Uh, so I get them in the studio and then I'm like, okay, well now I have to be producer because yeah. it's going to be my name on the record. Yeah. And I want you guys to sound good and everyone, all of this to be the best recorded and produced hip-hop music that's come out of this country. That yep. was my whole big goal, lofty aspirations. Um, but we turned out a solid record mm. and people liked it. Yeah, so I learned how to produce uh, during making that album. Yeah. Yeah. So what would be the sort of typical process for one of those tracks off that album? You were doing the beats first and then giving it to the guys and they were... Been starting to write things. Did you have an idea of the 
the yeah. lyrical content as well? Or were they pretty open? Or? That was that's pretty much how it went, man. Um, I was real open to subject matter lyrics. Yeah. It's like that's your domain. You're the MC. Yeah. Uh, and and in my mind, like a, a true hip hop MC, he writes his own raps. Yeah. You know, and they bring their personality and their stories and their feelings to the song, and there's really not much need to get in the way of that, mm. unless they're not being honest yeah. or they're not putting their all into the song, and that's all you're looking for. It's just, you know, an honest performance and the right level of energy. So mm. if the song is uh, intense and it's aggressive and it's, a, it's a, you know, about something that means something, then deliver it with some heart. You know, you can't just be on a laid back vibe when you're, just, you when know, you're talking about it. all the troubles of the world or something, <laughs> yeah. you know, or like some, um, you know, uh, injustice or something, you know, you can't be too relaxed. And vice versa, if you're doing a love song, you're talking to your girl, you can't be shouting you're at her. You're yelling, you yeah. Know? <laughs> hey, fuck, I love you! You know, it's, oh, okay, let's take it back, <laughs> you know. Deep breath here. So it's just, it's all contextual, and to me it makes sense, cause just from years of DJing, tons of music that I listen to, and seeing how it reacts with people, uh... All that stuff seems to come like second nature to me. Yeah, yeah. So the the production process was it, I guess, very similar to your uh, traditional recording process where you were sort of writing everything, then getting it down, and then mixing afterwards, and then mastering, or was it the separate sort of stages, or were they all kind of collapsed into? Um, because I know traditionally you'll see the guys will go and they'll track all their bits yeah. and pieces, and then that's almost done, then you go and you'll mix all the different parts down, and then that's finished, then it will go off to master. Yeah. I know a lot of electronic guys now, that all kind of, that mixing and It'll recording blur stage one blurs thing. into one thing. It's yeah. starting to blur a little bit more with us now, Yeah. Um, but back then, it was very much like, make all the beats, put them on a, a cassette tape, yeah. um, possibly a CD, if we had <laughs> access to a burner in those days. Uh, but yeah, the dudes would take the, the beats away, listen to it, call me back, be like, I like this one, They'd already have their raps, so like they'd write their raps to that music, or maybe they'd have, like Scribe would often have rhymes he just wrote mm. in a book with no music, mm -hmm. and then just pick the one that matches, yep. you know, and then anyway, come in and record, uh, yeah, record the vocals, and then I'd kind of sit, sit and look at it and usually find that my arrangement doesn't fit their, their lyrics yep. at all, yep. and so I'd have to change the arrangement of what I've done, mm -hmm. so kind of re-sequencing the beat, like rearranging the beat to match the vocals. And that's, yeah, I, and then once we get into the first stage of the mix, that's when I hear like like um, spaces and or things that need to be more full mm -hmm. or less, you know? So it'll be, okay, mute that part there. Uh, we need to bring a guitarist in to play that line there, double it for that part because yeah. it'll bring that out in that part of the song. Filter this here because he's saying these lines and this, you know, this makes yeah. sense. And and I let the the lyric kind of guide what you do with the music, mm -hmm. so that the yeah so that the music is actually presenting the vocalist in in their best light. Yeah, it's playing a supporting role, but yeah, but basically presenting in the best way that it can be. So yeah, it's I, re I really pay a lot of attention to the lyrics and what how they're being delivered and mm. what they say, as to how to take cues on what I should do with the music. Yeah, yeah. So then that's that's kind of done. And then the mix is kind of final, finalized, like we finish that off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, if it's an album project, do all the mastering all at once. Yep. So just stack all the tracks, and then once you've got, say, a dozen, then go back through the mixes and p compare A, B, all of them, make mm -hmm. sure there's kind of a consistency throughout. Yep. So, you know, um, it's not like one track has the biggest drums in the world and the rest of the album's little. You know, just yeah. get a nice flow that makes sense for the music, and yep. then master that whole lot and throw it out there are you normally then working with the idea of a album in mind rather than a pile of singles is there sort of a, a bigger plan when you sit down and go right i want to start doing some new material it just depends on the vibe like for me i just make i make beats yeah without i try not to let any of that stuff creep into the creative space of like what is this going to be yeah at the end because you don't want to get ahead of yourself and mm. it's just like try and be really pure with the you know the creative side of it and don't think about uh radio or video or you know how what are people going to think or who is this for I, f I feel for at least at least for me all that would get in the way of me making anything good yeah so i just make music just to make it mm. and then have fun with it and then after say a little period of time i'll look back over all the things that i've written or put together and things will stand out you know mm. i'll usually put all them on, like maybe 30 beats or something in a in the car on a, like on a CD drive around and you sort of you know certain things will stand out yeah and I'll be like those are cool and they become like the A-list and then 
eventually that I'll like go farm them out to people. Be like, oh, you should, I need you on this, or want yeah. you on this, or can you listen to that? And then people come back, write their stuff, and we record it. And that becomes the album. Mm. Yeah. So, you, so, so just a quick question there. A, a rap track sounds so different. It's got a vocal on it compared to just the backing without the vocal. Sure. How do you do? You have a, a method for first of all figuring out you've done a beat and not sort of overcooking it because they've got to be a bit sort of sparse for the vocal to yeah. sit well on top. And then when you're driving around trying to figure out which beats are good you're hearing them without the vocal on, so you rapping along in your car? <laughs> um, no, like, I mean, sometimes I just give that same disc to, say, Scribe or someone, and he'll pick his favourites. Okay. Uh, when it's when I'm making my own albums, I, I've got to... I've got, they've got to be my favourite beats out of the ones that I've made. So, yeah, it's just a case of... Yeah, they will sometimes... They'll often be sketches, you know, or things that are not fully completed ideas, yeah. but there's enough there... You know, where I'm like, Take that's that's a strong vibe. Like, that's wicked on its own. Right. Mm -hmm. Even without the the chorus and the verses and, and all the different changes and, and maybe a bridge and all the other elements, it's just cool. Like, that's a cool beat. Put that on and you move. Like, yeah, yeah that feels wicked. And play it to someone who knows nothing about technical side of music mm -hmm. and they also react. Like, well, that's cool. What's that? Mm -hmm. You know, those are the things I'm looking for out of my own stuff or when I listen to other people's beats. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm just looking for that that cool groove or hook or melody or something unique that makes it special.